Connors T, how are ye? Welcome to the Candle Tales podcast, where we tell stories from Irish mythology and folklore and chat about them. With this series of stories, we're telling, and in some cases retelling, the classics. If you don't know much about Irish myths, you might be familiar with these. And if you're just starting out, starting to explore Irish mythology, these are a really good place to start, because we get to know about them in primary school. Now, this story is the story, Birth of Satanta. This podcast is brought to you by our supporters at Patreon. You can join them at patreon.com forward slash Candle Tales or make a one-time donation on the PayPal button on our website, candletales.ie. Like and share and above all, enjoy these stories. For now, here, Sarika, tell us the story, will you? The Birth of Satanta A chariot, a war chariot, only has room in it for one, and that one is the warrior, who stands inside and throws their spears and fires their slingshots and pays no mind to the horses, because the horses are driven by the charioteer, who does not stand inside the chariot but in between the horses, along the wooden spar that juts forward. The charioteer stands there, one hand on the reins of each horse, in between their moving bodies, and relies on the warrior to protect them, to deflect any missiles that are fired. No honourable warrior would target a charioteer, but accidents happen. And in the fray of battle, they happen easily. A slip. A tug on one rein at the wrong time. And a charioteer can fall. Falling from a swiftly moving chariot under the hooves of the horses, under the wheels of the same vehicle they drove a moment before. To be a charioteer is no task for the faint of heart. And a charioteer and their warrior must have kind of trust between them. A flow between them where one believes in the other. The warrior trusts the charioteer to drive them true, to not jolt them at the wrong moment, to foul their cast of spear or slingshot. The charioteer must trust in their warrior to protect them and keep them safe. And all of these things must happen in the split second decisions of a battlefield. So the charioteer and their driver must be close. And what's closer than siblings? The best charioteer for the King of Ulster was his sister Dectra. Not only because of her skill and because of her nerve and because of her daring but because she was his sister. And she understood him and knew him And he knew her in a way that most people never will. Both of them were the children of the same mother. Nessa, Ni Esa, the ungentle one. Both of them grew up under her high expectations and her exacting standards. And Krahur was dutiful. Krahur took his mother's ambition and made it his own, Dectora was always a little wilder. Dectora always wanted to go her own way. But she found enough freedom and enough cooperation in being the charioteer of her brother, the King of Ulster.
but she could not remain a charioteer forever. Marriage loomed, and for someone of her station, marriage was unlikely to be for love. The sister of a king might find love within marriage. She certainly could refuse suitors she found disagreeable, but that was not quite the same thing as marrying for love. It was not quite the same as following your heart's desire. But Dector found no objections to Sulazin Macroy. He was a lord of land of Ulster. He was not a warrior himself, but he was wealthy and he was well connected. And he was fine. There was nothing wrong with Sulazin Macroy. And because Dector. Dector had never been in love. She'd heard stories of love, of course, that wild, self-destructive passion, but she'd never felt it for herself, and she couldn't help but pity the people in those stories. If that was where they got their thrills, they must never have driven a chariot into a battle, with only a warrior at their back to defend them, and only if his attention wasn't split in any one of a thousand ways. They must never have known any real excitement. So she was content enough to get married. That must be what this was. Contentment. The lack of a solid argument against. No firm reason to say no. No great desire to say yes. But that's why they called it contentment and not delight. Those around her were excited. A wedding is always an exciting time. And her handmaidens gathered and combed out her hair and painted her nails and stained her cheeks and she dressed herself in fine clothing and she was ready for a contented life although she hoped she might still drive a chariot a time or two. She hoped that she was not bidding farewell to excitement forever. But then something happened as she was getting ready for her wedding feast. A shaft of sunlight pouring through the window And she saw in the sunlight the face of a man, bright and beaming and beautiful as the sun. She saw him smile at her. She saw him see her back. She saw him hold out to her a cup of wine. And she reached out her hand and she took it. And in that moment, she was somewhere else. Her hand touched his hand as they both cupped the wine. And she saw in that liquid a mayfly. And he said, Do you want it? And she did. She took the wine and she drank it, all in one go, rich and wild on her tongue. She felt herself swallow down the little life. She felt it take root. And he said, do you want to stay with me for a while? And she did. And he tasted even better than the wine. It had been three long years 
since the king's sister had gone missing on her wedding day. She and all of her handmaidens vanishing as if into thin air. And now, it seemed that Ulster was under a new curse. A flock of birds had come. And they must have been birds from the other world, for they flew in pairs, chained together at the throat with silver and gold. And they sang sweetly, but when they descended, they landed on the fields of crops and ate them all. Not in the manner of normal birds taking what a bird might need to survive, but eating until there was nothing left but bare soil. And so Crohur MacNessa gathered his warriors. And they set off on a bird hunt. They followed that terrible flock as it flew, darkening the skies. They followed it until they could see it no more. They followed it until it led them into a strange country that none of them recognised. Although they should not be that far from Bruna Boynia, the territory was strange, the landscape different than they would have expected. And night began to fall. King Crohor sent out men to scout the territory, to find a place where they might rest safely for the night. He knew they were in a strange land and they might be subject to strange dangers. The first scout to come back was Bikru of the Bitter Tongue and he said, I've found somewhere, but it's not suitable. Small and mean as a shepherd's hut, with planks that aren't really together so that the wind whistles through them. And there's a loutish fella that answered the door, and he said we might come in and rest our heads, but I think we should keep looking. And so Crohor sent Fergus MacRoy go and have a second opinion. Check this place that Bikru had found, for the man did like to put a negative spin on things. Fergus came back with a different tune. He said, I don't know what Bikru was talking about. It's a palace. It's magnificent. A huge, lavish feasting hall. Hung with tapestries. A fine, tall lord answering the door. And he said we'd be welcome for this night is auspicious. For his wife, this very night, is lying in the bed of childbirth. So they went to the place. Crohor wondering all the time if Bikru had been exaggerating or if he had found a different house altogether, but Bikru and Fergus both swore that this was the same house and it looked more like Fergus's description than Bikru's. And the lord who welcomed them in was handsome and fine and tall. He brought them in and he sat them down and they were served a feast by handmaidens who looked strangely familiar to Crohor, though he could not place any of them. They ate, they drank, and they heard the sounds of the woman in childbirth in the nearby room. And when night fell, they were all led to couches where they could sleep. The morning sun was oddly bright the next day. And when Crohor blinked his eyes open, he realised that there was no roof between him and the sky. The sun was bright because the sun was beating down directly on him. That fine hall where he had spent the night, that fine couch where he had lain the night, they were gone. He was lying on a cold hillside and he sat up and showered from the back of his cloak the dried leaves that were piled up in the shape of a couch. And he got up and stared about him and roused his men 
and Bickrew grumbled that all had been a trick, and Fergus marvelled at the magic they had witnessed. And Crahor could not help but think that he was missing something. And it was only when he came back to his chariot that he saw. For she was sleeping underneath it. She was curled up in her cloak. The floor of the chariot making a little roof for her. That chariot that was as familiar to her as it was to him. For nearly as often as he had ridden in it, she had been driving it. It was Dectra, his sister, who had been his charioteer. And she was curled up around something. The men gathered and the men gaped. And they saw the child stir, and then Dectra herself stirred and woke and sat up and looked at her brother with a grin that he had missed these three years. She said, I didn't want my son not to be an Ulster man. So I sent the birds to go and get you. Grohor couldn't think of a word to say. So he looked at the child in her arms and he said, And who's that? Satanta, she said. Your nephew. My son. I'm bringing him home now. And so she did. <laughs> 